Good morning again. You are muted. Good morning. Good morning. As always, every time I see that beautiful face, I just feel so proud. Are you? You are from my uh, son. <laughs> by <my mother>. so, <laughs> I'm going to ask you uh, a few questions, but I'm going to start with you. Tell us your name. Tell us a little bit about you. Anything you wish to share so we can get to know you. Um, my name, so, hi, my name is Jabril Reeves. I am an attorney in New York City. I work for Ropes and Gray, um, where I do corporate law. I'm from Atlanta, Georgia. I was born and raised in Atlanta, Georgia. Went to the University of Georgia for undergrad. I went straight through to Duke Law School after that. Um, yeah, 25, <laughs> turning 26 very soon. Um, so, yeah. Happy early birthday. Thank you. Uh, do you have children? Are you married? Um, <laughs> brothers, sisters, you know, those kinds of things? Um, I have uh, one sister and two brothers, actually. Um, no children, <laughs> no wife, none of that. Um, yeah. Are, you, are your Girl brother with, uh, and sister with you in New York, or are they still in Atlanta? Oh, yeah. So my sister is here with me in New York. Um, my brother is actually staying in Indiana, but um, yeah, my sister. She's actually up here in New York. My parents uh, live in Atlanta right now, still. So. Excellent. Can you tell me what it was like to grow up in Atlanta? Um, so I enjoyed um, growing up in Atlanta. Um, I felt one of the things that stood out to me most, especially once I left the area, was that it was like 99% black people, um, you know, especially where I uh, grew up in Southwest Atlanta. Um, it was pretty much exclusively, um, yeah, people that look like me. And so I think that experience kind of shaped um, my perspective growing up. In some ways, you know, at first I really didn't appreciate the fact <laughs> that it was that many Black people and that I could grow up, you know, seeing like doctors, lawyers, you know, the mayor, you know, pretty much every aspect of life um, being represented, but then also kind of put us in a bubble, um, considering that, you know, due to segregation, to be honest, um, both, um, you couldn't really see other sides of the coin. And so you really only had one experience. And so I think growing up and coming outside of that, I think gave me a level of confidence because I knew who I was, mm -hmm. um, but also helped me learn a lot because, you know, in comparison, you kind of see what, what it's like outside of that, you know, growing up outside of that bubble, um, I think it gives me a new, gave me a new appreciation for like how much, how far we need to come and like, you know, what needs to be done to an extent. As a young person or even as a teenager and a college student in Atlanta, have you ever felt unsafe? To your person yes. specifically? Um, yes, actually, so never really in Atlanta. I think that was one thing, you know, obviously, you know, there were issues with any major city, but I think, um, you know, I, I was fairly sheltered and so I think I saw a kind of different experience, but I think going outside of Atlanta and going to places like Statesboro, Georgia, or um, University of Georgia, um, Athens, you you definitely run into different people. So I think those are a couple of first times where I was, um, you know, called a racial slur, um, and I really had those experiences of um, actual racism versus, uh, you, know, you know, just normal experiences. How did you respond when you were called the racial slur? So, um, and it happened, actually happened a couple of times, and I think that was one of the things that um, people don't understand or kind of don't really appreciate is that a lot of these things happen kind of consistently um, in a lot of these areas. And like, you know, I think before social media, maybe it wasn't as uh, promoted and you couldn't really see it as often, but you know, it. I think the first time was, um after um you know coming from a bar with a couple of friends and you know walk past these two people um actually there's three people and you know one woman she looks at me and i just kind of look back at her and then you know one of her friends jumps in and says you know what are you looking at you know inward and so and me coming from atlanta and not really ex having those experiences before that really not appreciating that that still happens you know i was kind of taking it back but then i also knew who, um, because like down the road, there were a couple of police officers that my response couldn't, you know, I couldn't 
respond back like you know obviously like very aggressively or, or trying to like you know make too much of the situation because at that moment it's pretty much just gonna be my word against his and you know down there you you can't really expect justice in a way obviously considering everything that's going on right now um you know just to happen because something happens like that so i really you know kind of responded very what's the word um carefully cautious i think patiently at that point yeah cautious cautious is a better word um and then uh i think another instance actually was when i was going to a football game and so i'm, I'm like and it was parents weekend so my parents were like walking behind me and these like guys rolled past me and like yelled out just you know yelled out the n-word and so at that point um again my parents actually told me not to do anything you know they were the ones who were like you know don't even worry about it like you know it's no point in, in you making more of the situation because you know consider where we at you know in atlanta maybe that's one thing where you can really stand up for yourself and, and really on the south side but um otherwise it's just not that's not a place you know that you can really honestly stand up for yourself sometimes because <laughs> that the people who are who are coming to help aren't really there to help you they're going to help someone else um and then a, a couple of instances after that where you know just in moments where i think people are too drunk you know and they say certain things and i think that's one thing that people don't realize you know some of these southern towns nothing has really changed from now to 20 30 40 years ago you know people say the same things especially once they start drinking and they get comfortable you know you can't really control those things and so that always kind of gave me a clue that um you should be careful and you should um really monitor who you're around um and that um actually led me to kind of to handle the situation at duke um in sort of the same way um so i in uh, i guess let me back up so uh the story is basically um this guy threatened to kill you know, three, um, three of my classmates. Kill you. Me and two of my classmates. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah, well, and again, he was drunk, but, you know, he said those words. So where, where, is, the, where is the line? This was but, at, um, at Duke. Are you a Duke law student? Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. Uh -huh. I'm sorry. So, and, and yeah, and, and, and I mean, these are the things that you can't really talk about, <laughs> honestly. And I think I'm being more honest now because, you know, considering what's going on around us, these things are connected. So I think, you know, sp not speaking up is an issue in itself. But, um, you know, uh, so, you know, he start, he, that's, that's, the, <laughs> that's the, I think, the, the summary of it. The story is, you know, he, he's out, um, you know, at the same event that me and my two friends are at. And I showed up late, you know, I, I come to just kind of check in on my friends, you know, hang out a little bit. And he gets upset with my friend over something dumb. And I stand up for my friend, um, uh, one of my black classmates who was graduating with me, with me. And he just keeps getting upset, keeps getting upset. <laughs> and basically, I guess because I wasn't giving him the reaction that he expected. And I think that's what a lot of people don't understand is that, you know, having these experiences in my past allowed me to take that situation into in, in full perspective and know that, OK, like he's obviously drunk. You know, he's, he's going to say whatever right now to try and get me upset. And then if I do something wrong, it's just gonna be my word against his. And that's a, I think that's a kind of like, you know, it's a reason that, you know, white people go around calling people in words, you know, trying to get a rise out of them, trying to make them do things because it's like, you know, it's a power, I think, aspect at, at that point. And so I realized, you know, kind of early on that like my power comes from just handling the situation and I think it's best. And so I really, you know, handled that patiently, didn't do anything. And still the response from the school, I think was very inadequate. I don't think that they supported me in the way that I would have expected, you know, considering that I was graduating at that point, that I'd already, you know, found my job. I'd been a contributing member of the school, but it, it seemed very much just like they were trying to protect him as much as they were trying to protect me. Um, and I, I, I think that's based on race um, wholeheartedly, considering that, you know, they, they know who their donors look like. They know, um, what type of stories they're willing to promote because, you know, if they promote my story and give me the adequate justice, maybe it makes them look bad to certain people who think that they're supposed to sweep those things on the rug. Or maybe that that's not something worth, you know, kicking a student out for, you know, killing, uh, threatening to kill three black students, no matter what the context is. Um, but I always said, you know, if, if the roles were reversed, 
this would have been a completely different story. You know, we wouldn't, you know, they would have, they would have picked me out immediately. And, but I always know that that's the game that we're supposed to play. And I think, you know, these moments like Ahmaud Aubrey, um, you know, like, again, like, where it's like vigilantes can do whatever just because you fight back, <laughs> you know, they could be in the wrong, but then you fight back. And then if they kill you, you're, you're seen as the aggressor. So, you know, Trayvon Martin, same thing, you know, he, he's getting chased by somebody random, this guy being the aggressor and then you, you, you fight back. And then, you know, if, you, if something happens, what can you do? So I keep those things in mind at, at, at a lot of points um, because, you know, that's, that's the reality of the world we live in right now. So go back to Atlanta, because I want to revisit the Duke story in a minute, but go back to Atlanta. Your mother and your father are still there. Mm-hmm. And, and, and your brothers and sister are elsewhere. Mm-hmm. Do you worry yes. about the safety and wellness of your, your, your mother and your father? Um, um, not, not just only health, but their physical safety as well, being in Atlanta, or is that not an issue in Atlanta? I don't think that's the issue, and especially for where they, where they do. And I mean, I, I also just know, my, I mean, my dad is <laughs> a very, he's a very cautious person. He, he did security for a long time. And so I think he understands kind of the, the reality of the situation. And I, honestly, I mean, <laughs> what I'm realizing is that the police kind of make things a little bit worse, you know, depending on where you are. So I think their safety oftentimes is, you know, detrimental if you're in certain areas where it's like heavy police and, you know, it's heavily policed, you know, they take away resources. And luckily in Atlanta, in certain places, they're able to have more control. And so they have more resources, you know, people aren't as, you know, you know, you aren't going around doing desperate things. You know, I just talked to my mom the other day um, about this and she said, yeah, I, I realized that. And I've always been a champion of that. And people don't break into places, you know, because they have everything, you know, they break into places because they don't have everything. And I think where I live, that's, you know, at least to an extent, people try and help each other and really try and support each other um, to be able to not really have those issues as much. But I mean, I, my concern now is that, you know, the government has only gave people $1,200, you know, for four months at this point after losing their jobs. And we have like record unemployment levels. We, you know, we, we have no basic avenue out of this and so people are going to get to a point where they're going to get desperate. And, and that's my concern because I'm like, you know, that's one thing that people have been paying taxes for a long time. Like we, we expect protection from the people who we're giving all these money to and it's basically nothing happening and they're taking money for themselves. So, yeah. you know, that, me, that's my concern. Yeah. Let me ask you this. Take me from the day you graduated from UGA to your acceptance at Duke Law and, and through your three years at Duke Law. What was the experience, the entire experience? I mean, you don't have to be, you know, say anything that you don't feel comfortable saying, but, but could you describe the experience from being, graduating from UGA, being accepted at Duke, and where you found yourself once you arrived at Duke? Oh, like that, that, that middle period honestly was very interesting. I did an internship, a legal internship. Um, pretty much the Monday after I graduated from uh, UGA. Um, and it helped me kind of, I think, get a perspective on what I was going into starting law school. Um, but the legal department was very black. And actually one of the women kind of helped push me um, to go to Duke because at that point I was still on the waiting list. And so uh, talking with one of the black women there, um, I think she just saw something in me that was really, um, I, I still don't know to this day, but uh, she she really uh, she made a call and she was like, hey, like you should really you know take a second look at this candidate. I'd done a lot of like um, talking with him at that point, and um, I think she really helped open the door for me. And so just having that experience um, all together, so her helping me and then getting the chance to like learn about the law, you know, before law school, I think really helped um, me gain a perspective. But I think I was still concerned because. You know, obviously I was a black man going into this environment where obviously I was very young. I, I went straight through. So I knew my experience was going to be a little bit different from people who had worked or who had children or who had come from different lives, you know, who are quote unquote more accomplished. But I think I just tried to keep my confidence at that point and let, you know, tell myself that I wouldn't have made it here if 
I wasn't going to be, you know, successful. And they, you know, I, obviously they thoroughly vetted me <laughs> um, before that. So I feel like I can still make it. So you were experiencing, <laughs> did you feel like you were supported for your three years? I felt like I was supported by the um, some of the faculty and definitely the students around me. I don't necessarily think the administration was um, very supportive, but I think that's, you know, a byproduct of just how the law school model is set up to an extent. You know, a lot of the focus for deans is on, you know, or for a dean is on how much money they can raise, you know, how they can best help the, you know, board rather than actually impacting the students' lives. And if we consider who the, you know, all the trustees are going to be, it's going to be alumni. But if Black people couldn't go, you know, to schools, into those schools 30 years ago, then there's going to be no one who are really advocating for us in those rooms to do anything. So I never felt, you know, obviously when I had the experience with the, um, you know, with the guy threatening to kill us, I felt like the administration slowed us down. You know, they were the main problem in us, you know, kind of holding him accountable. Because from our perspective, it should have been a very simple process, but for them, it made it very complicated. But I think that's when it really hit me that they're not set up to get us justice or to advocate for our experience. They're there to keep money flowing to the school so they can keep doing these things. So, you know, I never felt like they were supportive, but I definitely think the faculty. So, I mean, I can, you know, Guy Charles, I think was somebody who I think was very supportive of me. And a lot of my research, uh, Trina Jones, she was one woman who I think I took many of her classes. She taught me so much. And I think from the moment she met me was super impactful. Obviously, you and Skip um, supported me in different ways, just, you know, by giving me a home experience and a way to kind of have moments of peace outside of <laughs> uh, the law school and without thinking about law school and um, Ebony Bryant, so, so many people, I think that really helped making it community. I think that was one thing that I saw when I visited Duke, that the community outside of the administration was going to be so supportive and helpful. And I found that so much within the students and the um, faculty and staff, for so sure. Every, so everyone you've named just now, Guy, a lovely man, Trina, a brilliant woman, me and my husband, you know, being uh, a place to come get a home-cooked meal, all are black and brown people. Have you had any white faculty at Duke Law who were supportive of you and helped you advance in your education and in your career? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I, Paul, Hagen, <laughs> Paul Hagen was always somebody. I, like, I think he was probably one of the ones that I really I, I saw he took an interest in me, you know, and was really wanted to talk to me. And I think he found my perspective very different. And, you know, obviously, and him and Brock Richmond were uh, two professors that always stood out to me who were very, um, I think, invested in what I was doing. And Gordon, I think, is one woman. She's Now, she definitely is somebody who went to bat for me a lot of times. And I think I could really go talk to her if I needed to. So I think there were, you know, there's, there's, there's pockets of it, but, but I think when you, when I think back on my experience, I think that's what Duke wants to an extent. They don't really want me to have that support system and they don't really find people, I think, who are going to necessarily focus on that. That's not really their model, but I don't think that Duke is abnormal in that aspect though. And I think that's one thing I realized as well is that that wasn't something where it's like Duke specific, like everybody you know, from a lot of schools deal with the same issues because this is a legal problem, this is a world problem, more than it is just like Duke, you know, dealing, you know, not being very supportive of their black students. But yeah, there, I mean, there were a few, um, I mean, the, the people I named obviously, and I might be not, you know, obviously could, maybe not thinking of the person who may be super helpful, but I doubt it. <laughs> I, I know who I attract and I know who I, I, who I focus on it. I mean, honestly, I think that's just a byproduct of growing up where I grow up. I, it's not that I see every black person is just like the most, you know, super helpful and they're obviously gonna have my back because what's the quote that like all uh, skin folk aren't kin folk, you know, you can't really just trust somebody because of their skin color. But I think, and what I think people don't realize is that there's certain common realities that come with being a black person. There's certain ways of 
um, engaging with each other that if you really are a good person that it can go a lot farther because you have those commonalities, which is why we need more diversity in the first place. Because it's like, you know, I should be able to find that at each place. You know, I'm never going to be as comfortable with um, a white person, to be honest, as somebody who has come from, you know, lived black experience who actually knows what these things mean. And having us in more of these roles will do wonders. But I mean, you know, that's when we need more black leadership in the first place. So, I mean, that's what's wrong with the administration. <laughs> So um, I've known you for three years, going on four now, I believe. And mm -hmm. uh, you're a brilliant young man. You have a great job. You're an advocate for others. And you have taken time to accept all people as they are, but you meet them where they are in the seat that they are. You're not trying to change them or make them, if, if they're racist, they're racist. If they're not, they're not. Um, I think we both can say unilaterally, not all white people are racist, mm -hmm. but yeah. a lot of times the dollar carries the day, not, not <laughs> the well -being of your, your community or whatever. It's the dollar that really carries the day. So um, thank you for very much for acknowledging, you know, um, one of the things I tell people all the time, you know, all those meals that we made, we pay for out of our pocket. You know, no one ever said, hey, here, let me give you a couple of dollars or we know you're going to do this, you know. And I also remember when you made me make you sweet potato lasagna. I'm still kind of bothered about that because I'm like, sweet potatoes don't belong in a lasagna. That was that period you were going to your vegetarian kind of time. I didn't, I didn't make you make it. Yes, you did. It, it was a threat. I felt threat. I felt like I was in harm's way. I'm just kidding. No, you just go above and beyond. I don't. I do think I'm appreciative, but I'll I'll never expect anybody. Mel did that to me one time too. She said I made her make something because I suggested it. I was like, no, I'm just. I will request something, but not you know. But like I'll request something, or I will just you know be like, hey, I'm eating this now, and somebody be like I'll make it for you. I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> that's a lot of pressure. Yeah, no, 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 I, I'm just joking with you. And uh, I've made uh, sea potato lasagna since then. So you've given me a new recipe to add to my collection. So thank you for that. Let me ask you, leaving Duke Law to go to the law firm where you are now, what was that transition like? It was very tough, honestly. I mean, coming to New York alone was just a very, very tough experience. Um, all things considered, um, <laughs> it's, it's been something unexpected and and out of the blue, I mean, but everybody said that that's the New York experience, you know, moving up here is going to be its own battle, like really adjusting to the pace, you know, nothing's like it. Obviously, I came from, I came from Georgia, went to North Carolina, and then you come to New York, that's a, obviously a completely different experience. So it was, it was definitely a learning experience. And I think just figuring out what, what I wanted to do in terms of like my free time, considering I was going into a very stressful job, you know, finding out you know, where to live that was going to be in the right place that allowed me access. And then, you know, really just, again, the pace is is something that even if you come visit, I think it doesn't really do it justice because it's really that point of, you know, you're doing it every single day that, um, you know, makes it tough. But I will say, and this is one thing that I just never expected, the, the um, COVID-19 has just made it com completely different. You know, it's a very different city now. It's a lot more um, the roads are a little bit more open. People people slow down a lot, and I think this is going to be something where it's like just a completely unexpected experience now, and um, something where I really look back on it. I, I, <laughs> to an extent, I want to make a journal or like just kind of document this time because I'm like I know this is going to be something that's going to be extremely rare. Mm -hmm. So so let me ask you this: um, We're going to talk about eight minutes and forty six seconds in just a minute. But, but I want to ask you uh, this question right here. So being in New York, have you felt unsafe or felt that there was some harm to your person possible? Not, not, not to an extent. Um, I mean, just the area I live in, I feel very protected. Um, and I think New York is different than, I mean, obviously there's places that you can't go, but I mean, I, I try and avoid those areas. Um, but I think it's such it's such a vibrant city to an extent and like it doesn't really sleep that you kind of feel protected if you stay out of certain areas. So, I mean, I've been told by a lot of people like don't, don't go into the parks at night, you know, don't, you know, you may not want to be on the street if there's like no, you know, it's nothing but closed shops after a certain time. But I think in the area that I live in, Washington Heights is, you know, perfectly fine. I walk around all the time. 
Um, and I feel like that's not really something. I think, you know, I, once COVID-19 kind of got bad and it was one of those points where it was the epicenter, I think that was where it just felt very stressful. Yeah. You know, I heard ambulances all the time, and I think that was a moment where um, it really hit me that things got were, were really getting bad. But I think it's calmed down since then, you know, for sure. And I think now it's like transition. And I think even then I never felt unsafe. It was just very uneasy considering that, you know, the entire, like, you know, the entire city was shut down. I think that was the, the, the big part. Yeah. So um, eight minutes and 46 seconds. What can you do in that amount of time to your person? Can you hold your breath for eight minutes and 46 seconds? Can you run a mile in eight minutes and 46 seconds? I, I, I don't run, so I don't know if that's possible. But eight minutes and 46 seconds to die for $20. It's mind boggling. Mm -hmm. I mean, have you seen the video? I I didn't actually watch the video. Um, I don't really enjoy it. Well, obviously nobody enjoys watching the videos, but I do think of them as entertainment to an extent um, because they do the way they show them sometimes. But I, I don't really, because I think you can learn about the, the person, you can learn about the experience and you can want justice for them without watching the video. And I think the only way, the, the good one, the good part about I think this video was that it was so long, you know, it was that long. It wasn't just a shooting. It wasn't just something where it's like something quick. Like people really had to watch this man die. And I think for some people who really showed them the issues um, that were going on, along with just, you know, there's nothing else to pay attention to right now. There are no other sports, you know. Um, you know, even television shows have stopped happening. Movies aren't getting released. And so I think people are singularly focused on this issue right now and understanding how deep it goes, you know, even um, a man was murdered by the Atlanta, Atlanta Police Department on Friday night, um, shot in the back. And so, you know, that moment, I think, kind of showed the, 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 the two sides of it. You know, somebody who can get just, obviously nobody cares. And the officer does not care about having a spoon snake and is willing to do that. But also is willing to just pull a trigger and shoot somebody in half a second without even thinking about it because they're running away from them. So, um, I, I, you know, I... I can't watch the video because I think it will just, it will really stress me out. I think it will really stress me out. Have you been to any of the protests or marches? Have you been out uh, with people marching and protesting against injustice? Yeah, I've, I've been to a couple of protests and I think they're a really good experience. Um, you know, they, I think they allow people to kind of reclaim their power um, to really get a chance to, you know, I think value, you know, show that black lives do matter. I mean, it, it sounds, <laughs> it sounds generic, but I think that's, that's one of the points where it's like really waking people up, allowing them to say, Hey, like, you know, listen to us really, let's, let's talk about these issues. Why are these things still happening? Um, if, if we're not bringing attention to them. And so, um, I, I truly feel like when I'm out there, I can like, you know, I feel more powerful. I feel like I'm a person who is able to, you know, really advocate for themselves in a way that I didn't feel like before. Excellent. So um, do you think all of these protests and, and the things that have been happening will result in real lasting change? I don't think the protests alone will do so, but I think they're going to put more light on this issue that needs to be addressed. Because I don't think this is the final step at all. I think this is honestly the early stages of a movement. Um, all things considered, I think it's, you know, right now we're just showing, <laughs> cause it's, it's not funny, but I think it's illuminating that, you know, we're protesting police brutality and the police's response is more brutality, right? And so that shows that the, the protests aren't enough. You know, the protests are just the beginning stages of, you know, putting light on the movement. I think the next steps are gonna be true legislation and then the response to that, because, you know, I think what people forget about history is that like with the civil rights movement, you know, they passed the Voting Rights Act, but then a lot of the legislation that came after that was challenged heavily and then it was, you know, caught up in court and things like that. And so I'm, I'm looking for, you know, actual change, you know, not just some laws being passed, like the A can't wait or whatever the, the, the one about trying to reduce, you know, police reform, I think is just not really the, the, the mode that we need to go down. And I think right now we're still on the stage of, oh, police reform is the final step, is the final goal. And even the governor of, of um, New York mentioned that we should stop protesting. 
because he's like, we get it. You know, systematic racism is the problem and we're going to put in these police reforms and like, this is the goal. And it's like, that's not the goal anymore. I think the goal is true, like um, pretty much police abolishment, you know, abolishing the prison industrial complex and like getting some of these systems out of the way that are holding um, black Americans back versus trying to just reform a system that is like, you know, already bad to begin with. So I, I don't see this as, I, I see change happening from this, but I think it's going to take like a swell of people really pushing, pushing for it. Um, but I mean, I, I think our generation wants it, you know, wholeheartedly. I think a lot of us are really on the same page about it. Yeah, excellent. I have uh, one last question and then I'm going to leave the rest of the time. We have three minutes. I have one last question. So I'm going to leave this, the rest to you, but let me ask this question. What does change look like? I mean, have, you know, we've seen more commercials with black and brown people in commercials. We've heard of uh, giving black and brown people jobs, which may, they may not even be qualified as, as the whites response to what they're seeing. So what does real change look like in, in everyday life? I mean, so we get laws changed and all that, but I mean, what does real change look like? I mean, to, to me, real change looks like this. Leveling out the playing field by taking money from police departments. You know, they got billion dollar budgets. Some of them have billion dollar budgets, but then you're taking away money from education. You're taking money away from housing. You're taking money away from uh, after school care. You're taking money away from groceries, those things, right? And so taking money away from police departments and putting it back into those communities. But I don't think that's enough because I think that doesn't address the, the, the past history and trying to, because it's like, if you put all these like extensive things and all these resources that people can't even access because we're still playing by the same rules, then what's the point? And so I think it's gonna be doing those things, but then giving black people access to capital. So I think if honestly, you know, change to me looks like reparations. It genuinely looks like them taking money, like putting the resources, like giving people access to these things and then giving them money to use them. Not saying, oh, we're gonna give you these resources and now you have to work as hard as you can to try and get a piece of it. No, because then that's what the unfairness goes in. And that's why you can, people can say, oh, because looking at it, you know, obviously I'm, I'll say I'm a history person, I'm an American history person. And so looking at the 1960s and 1970s, you're like wondering, okay, like, where was the change? You know, they, we, we got civil rights, but then what was the difference? And it's like, oh, well, they said black people could be free. We can have access to all these things. You know, the 80s and 90s showed that black people can make money. But then if it's like, it's still in the capitalism, you know, still under the idea that like, you're, nobody in your family can make any money, then what's the point? And so I think we have to like, kind of cut at those points and like really try and actually go beyond just, you know, people giving access and commercials and, you know, like the 80s and 90s where you see us in media and, and all over the TV and people know about us, but then they're not actually trying to help us. And so I think taking money away from some of these institutions and putting it back into black people. If they found trillions of dollars to bail out these corporations. Why not just give that to people? You know, why not think, give that to the ancestors of slaves? That can be directly documented that, you know, the ancestors to slaves should get a certain amount of money to get them back into the point that we're actually contributing to society and not society using us as labor, not using us as prison, you know, just to lock us up or to use us as like anything else you'd like to add that was great talking to you <laughs> and i'm sorry i missed you when you came to see me it probably one of those days i wasn't feeling my best and i'm sorry i missed you but i hope you'll be back soon no come visit me <laughs> no worries yeah of course and not you know i'll be there sooner than you think for yeah. sure <laughs> give me a warning i'll but, make it yeah i mean hmm if you give me enough warning, I'll make the sweet potato lasagna again too. <laughs> I'm back eating meat a little bit. I mean, I'm 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 back and forth. I think now I'm tired of cooking, okay. so <laughs> I just you know tired of all food. So I might transition to vegetarian again. But we'll see. I'll let you know. I'll give you a warning. <laughs> I appreciate that very much. Please tell your mother and your father and your sister and your brothers that I love them and I keep you your family in my prayers. So stay safe. Well. And, and you're going to be an exceptional, exceptional leader, Jabril, and you must hold on to that. So don't jeopardize. I know a lot of times we feel angry. I feel angry right now, but I could lose my job. I could lose my way of life. I mean, my son could lose his health care if I acted out upon how I feel. So remember that you are put in place to be a great leader. Be that great leader and make change for us all. 
Thank you so much. I really appreciate that, Roseanne. I love you. <laughs> I love you with all my heart, darling. I told you, my other son, you know, you know, me and your mom, I have to have a little discussion about, you know, sharing, but uh, absolutely. I love you too, darling. Thank you so much for doing this with me. Stay safe. No Come visit off, often. I will. <laughs> love and, you. And you all have a place to stay, so you don't have to go to a hotel. You can just stay with me, and I can just harass you the whole time you're here. <laughs> oh, that's the thing. I'll yep. say Jasmine and I can both come save that when we come. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. That'll work. Absolutely. <laughs> yep. save, save a little bit of money. Yep, absolutely. All right. We love you. Stay safe, bro. Exactly. Take care. Love you. Love I love you too. Bye. Very much. Bye.